This week on the Backtable Podcast. So this concept of trusting your gut, I think is key and helps me stay out of trouble. The great news for trainees is, in my experience, I'd love to know what your experience is. I think that nearly every resident already has this innate radar and all they have to learn is to trust it. So if a resident is dissecting in the wrong plane, and I tap them on the shoulder and say, how do you think things are going? They almost always say, not good. But all I have to teach them is, okay, when you have that not good feeling, change something. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Our next partner has a product I literally use every day. I've started taking AG1 because my friend Aaron Fritz actually kind of turned me on to it. And for me, I've always kind of intermittently fasted, and I like the idea of getting nutrition in without the calories that kind of come along with it that, you know, in my personal case, sometimes make me feel a bit groggy. My trainer turned me on to it. I, you know, I feel like I get better sleep, better workout recoveries from it. And yeah, like, and when we were in New Orleans for AUA, those travel packs really came in handy, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Sometimes I'll kind of, I generally do it first thing in the morning, but uh, depending on what the evening is looking like, I'll uh, maybe slide one in late night as well. <laughs> You know, the other great thing about it, because I don't really like taking vitamins, and I know a lot of people take different kinds of like multivitamins and stuff like that. But like you said, like you, you drink it first thing in the morning with some water, you know, you're getting a good 12 ounces of water to start the day out, and you know, you're getting all those vitamins. And so it's nice because it's all in one and you don't, you're not popping pills. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. I, uh, I hear you 100%. I, I'm not ready for my kind of Sunday through Saturday pill box as it stands. <laughs> To make it easy, Athletic Grains is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel pack with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com backslash backtable euro. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash backtable euro to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now, back to the show. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, David Keynes from Leahy Clinic. Thanks for joining us, David. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Aditya. Thank you a lot for having me. My pleasure, David. I've certainly been interested in the work that you've been doing on what I consider the surgeon side, maybe the softer side, the hard to pin down sides of our profession and particularly operations and how that may impact complications. And as I was preparing for this, I just reflected on the, on the past week I was doing an orchiectomy and I'm at a relatively newer institution and I wasn't sure if the testicular implant had arrived for a seven o'clock start. And so I was trying to track down the rep and it led to a bit of a delay and I was going to the operating room and I just found myself flustered and I kind of had to pause, take a reset, be like, okay, listen, it's not the end of the world. We have the implant. We're 20 minutes late. Take a deep breath, chill out and get on with it. But I, I can totally imagine how just going into an operating room, you know, not feeling confident, good, can impact things. And maybe I'll just start out with, if, if you want to comment on that, David. You know, I think the sports analogies in surgery are a little bit overdone, but we do have like a pregame routine and there's a certain comfort level that comes with whatever that is for you, whether what, no matter what kind of surgeon you are or proceduralist. When you're thrown out of your game, so you're in a new place, there are new people on your team, and something like an implant that you count on is now question mark. You know, it makes you feel very unsettled. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about your particular routines, or dare I say rituals? Is that kind of adding a, an element of, of hokiness to it? Are, are there certain things that you do, uh, maybe even before stepping into the operating room? Yeah. You know, when I'm at Leahy and that's the teaching hospital where I work, I, I also work at a different hospital where it's just me, but let's say I'm at the mothership, the resident uh, is in the room, the patient's 
being induced. And at that point, I might be up in my office before I get the call, hey, we're prepping. I'm usually pulling up relevant films and reviewing them with the eye to essentially picturing the operation unfold. That's my pregame. Yeah, I think that's kind of mandatory, right? We're going in there and where we need to have a, have a plan. And some of the, one of the things that I did early on, and, I, and I, this wasn't an original idea, was uh, Vince Ladone at Memorial said that he would call the patients the night before surgery and just let them know that he'd review the cases and he was thinking about them. And I, I do that. And unequivocally, that is the most impactful thing in terms of feedback that I received from patients. So in many ways, the pregame for me starts the day before. And certainly if it's a bigger case, you know, big RPL and D, cable thrombus, et cetera, it starts several days before, you know, not just a clinic visit, but then really re-reviewing imaging in, in a big way before the operation. So I think that preparedness is is really what you're getting at. Have you been able to maintain that even as you've gotten busier? The short answer is yes. It's gone from all cases to majors. Basically, anything open or robotic, you'll get a phone call. Ureteroscopies, TRBTs, things along those lines. It's a bandwidth thing and it's a bit of an excuse. But I have, yeah. And and it's, again, one of the things that I think patients appreciate incredibly. Yeah, I mean, I could see how patients would just love that. that They don't feel like a number. The surgeon is thinking about them. You know, I do something slightly similar. It's not the day before, but most medical records have a sticky note function, like as if you had a post-it note on the chart and it's a private place. When I see a patient, I'll put something in there that will remind me about them as a person, whether it's their occupation or something that they mention about their family. And then when I see the patient in the pre-op holding area, I mention something related to that, like, oh, how was the drive from such and such? Or comment about their occupation or something so that they realize, oh, hey, this this guy remembers me. I'm not just a number. If I was a patient and I knew that the doctor was using some kind of memory device to do that, I would still be happy about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it it shows that you care. You took the time. So you've reviewed the case. You reviewed the images in your head, and now you're in the operating room. Do you do anything intentional to kind of engage the team, the anesthesiologist, the CRNA, perhaps, the scrub, the nurse, the residents, anything that goes on in your operating room, David? I'll tell you, I take the timeout very seriously. I think the timeout itself can start to feel like just another thing that we have to do. I try to be very present during the timeout and especially the part where, I mean, every hospital is different. The part where we're all supposed to introduce ourselves, people can tend to skip over that, like, we all know each other and then we move on. I'm kind of a stickler about everybody saying their name out loud, even people that I've worked with for 20 years. It gives everyone a voice. I think that's really important. When you actually use your voice to speak into a room, it empowers you. So I won't skip over that. Yeah, I think that's great. And an initiative that I really like here at UC San Diego is that the OR perioperative services actually ordered hats with everybody's name. So, you know, UC San Diego, and then it said, you know, Dithia Bagrodia or Jane Smith, CRNA. And we all know there's so much power in knowing somebody's name. And I shudder to think about the numerous folks on the other side of the curtain that I've worked with, and I never knew their name for like years. And it's really, it's bad. You know, there's no kind of two ways about it. But I think that kind of getting everybody engaged and committing to the operation and that we're on the same team is is certainly got to be val- valuable for just establishing that that camaraderie. Absolutely. You know, we're going to get into a lot of topics, I'm sure, today, but I really see this as a cascade. When complications happen and then you rewind, what are all the things that you'd notice? Were you off your game from the very beginning? Did you take yourself out of your pregame? Did you not engage the team? I mean, these are all things that are very real. Yeah, and one of the things that I have gotten away from, and I started doing this really kind of when Black Lives Matter was at its peak a few years ago, is I would do a moment of silence, a one minute moment of silence before any, before starting the case. So we did the timeout, then we'd stop. And it was interesting. It was a bit uncomfortable at times. And I I never kind of dictated what people should be doing to that moment of silence. It was their own 
a fair, but I did hear some feedback that, you know, it was really nice to get grounded, think about it, you know, just remind yourself that you're operating on, on somebody and they're kind of trusting, trusting you with their lives. I'd like to get back to it. And honestly, it's this podcast that's reminded me of that. I think that's a nice thing, you know, anything that can bring us back to being present in the moment. You know, we're all, we always have this running to-do list in the back of our heads that can be distracting. But we've got somebody's brother, mother, father, sister on the table. You know, we all have to be there. All right, so so you've kind of gone through your pregame. You've interacted with everybody on your team, hopefully starting off on a, you know, nice positive note. And, you know, maybe I'll just ask you, David, like you're reflecting back on your career. You know, I think there's a 10 things that we've, or doctors, surgeons, that we were all like, you know, things just always seem to go well. And on the flip side, there's also some folks probably that you've encountered where like, you know, they, they seem to be a bit more of a frequent flyer on the complication list, m and Can you just think about some of the things, some of the qualities that you associate with physicians who generally have things go well? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is one of my favorite pet topics. I was conscious of this as a resident. I was fortunate enough to have, I mean, nearly every faculty that trained me was, was fantastic, but there were certain people that I wanted to emulate more than others. And I remember thinking, you know, what is it, can I actually quantify what it is about those people that makes them generally stay out of trouble and what makes them get in trouble, but get out quick. So there is, you know, there are about 10 or 11 characteristics of those surgeons that I try to emulate. Should we go through them? Yeah, I would love to hear it. Yeah. So my own feeling about surgery is that generally there are technical things that we need to learn, the knot tying, the suture throwing, the exposure techniques. The, but my feeling is that those aren't really where the magic happens. I think that our mindset is key. So the first thing about the people that I wanted to emulate is that they break down every step into the of the operation into micro steps. Like one step really has like 10 or 11 small steps. So, you know, I, I can use an example in robotic prostatectomy because that operation is so familiar to people. But if I'm going to drop the bladder, it's not just drop the bladder. It's pull down with the fourth arm, cut the peritoneum on the right side along the fat, of the bladder right down to the inguinal ring, go medially along the vas, repeat that on the left side, divide the three ligaments, I heavy bipolar the top side to avoid bleeding, I find the pubic bone, which is a plane between two layers of fat, I expose the endopelvic fascia, I go to the iliacs last, I make sure the peritoneum's down to the obliterated ligament. I'm just listing this because, you know, the details don't matter, but what matters is I have that step down to a whole bunch of tiny steps. And that's something that I, I, I got from the people that I was trying to mimic. Do you have anything like that? Absolutely. So a dear mentor and colleague, Klaus Warburn, who was, our, who was my chairman as a trainee and then faculty at UT Southwestern, when you did prostatectomies with him, everything was in excruciating, gory detail. I'll give you an example. You know, for the bladder, for the anastomosis, you know, first you have a bipolar in your left hand to manipulate the bladder, needle drive on the right. You hold the needle back at the roughly, you know, 70% of the way back from the tip to where the suture starts at a 90 degree angle. You clock your hand and you rotate like this. And for the next throw, and these are done with your ipsilateral hand. When you move to the three o'clock, you hold the needle at this angle with the contralateral hand. As you get more anterior, it's a very, very obtuse angle and you're all the way out at the tip of the needle. And those things stuck with me. And I, you know, of course I made details notes. And, and the next time when you could demonstrate that you actually paid attention and committed some of that to memory, you got to go. You got to do it. Yep. And that's absolutely, I mean, your kind of bladder drop steps sound exactly like mine. It's like bipolar up top first, and then you bipolar down below. Now you have your umbilicus naturally giving you cranial tension and you're pulling down. And it's this little stuff. And, and I think that Trainees absolutely appreciate that. It's not just do it, but it's like, here's 
exactly how to do it. So I've definitely come across that it's invaluable, I think, to have that detailed instruction. And then, of course, you know, certainly, you know, we're in academics, the trainee can kind of take that. And it also allows you to stick to the game plan. I think when the anatomy is different, things are weird. That's when you have to really stick to the game plan. Exactly. Any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I think you could take this to literally anything that any surgeon does, whether I remember putting in central lines. I mean, I had a specific order that I unpacked the kit when I drew up the lidocaine, where I placed my equipment in front of me, the order that I, you know, back then we were doing blind central lines, which is not not done anymore. But if you don't do this, you will operate like you are operating somewhat aimlessly. If I tap a resident on the shoulder who seems to not be progressing and I say, tell me what this step is, that resident will give me a vague answer, like drop, I'm dropping the bladder and not a goal-directed step like I'm cutting the perineum towards the ring. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. It changes the way your attitude. Yeah, I think reflecting on it, we you kind of mentioned checklist, but this is an extensive checklist probably of, you know, 400, 500 steps really for a a more complex operation like a prostatectomy. And, you know, certainly if it's something like a tumor thrombectomy or PLND, that checklist has got to be just ultra exhaustive in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, let's take another example with injuring the obturator nerve. You know, the classic lecture about this would be describing the obturator nerve anatomy and here's what to avoid. But in the context of what you and I are discussing about having micro steps and checkpoints and checklists, I'll get very, very specific. If I'm doing a a limited lymph node sampling, we can debate whether that is, should be done or not, but I won't take the packet in the corner approximately right by the nerve until I see the full length of the nerve. If I don't have that view, I won't put that clip on. And it's the one case where you skip that little micro step and you you ignore that checkpoint. You say to yourself, well, I know where the obturator nerve is. That's the time when you put the clip across it and you ligate it. So the micro step is almost like a superpower. You reach certain junctures and you won't progress unless you see landmarks that you're looking for. Yeah, I like that. And I tell the residents this somewhere along the course of their time with me or multiple times that it's always better to know than to believe. And that's from Ayn Rand, actually. And, you know, there's certain things that you cannot skimp. You know, you have to know where your obturator nerve is. If you're doing an extended lift of a session, you have to know where your ureter is. You can't kind of think you know where your ureter is or you're going to come across it. And, you know, if you're if you're doing a big kidney mass, you're coming across the free tail of your rotas, you have to know where your iliacs are. These are things that, you know, there is no compromise on them. And it is empowering because I think going back to classic stuff, know the anatomy, all that kind of stuff is important. But when you know that, you understand how that kind of plays into your ability to safely execute an operation, it's empowering. Absolutely. And, you know, we know the anatomy, but the anatomy from our point of view now is practical surgical anatomy, and it's a little bit different, especially with minimally invasive surgery. We now see things in little tiny vignettes where we've zoomed in, and we're looking for landmarks that allow us to progress to the next micro step. There's probably some analogy doing a cholecystectomy and avoiding the the common bile duct. I mean, whatever that triangular anatomy is that I forget now, <laughs> is the general surgeons have checkpoints too, where they if they skimp on that or they skip it one one time, that's the case where you injure the common duct. So have you ever come across cases where things don't look right to you? You haven't been able to see what you want to see? You feel like you're you're kind of struggling? Yes. It happens all the time. But I'm I'm relentlessly impatient with myself. So I won't struggle with a certain view or step for long before I change something because I'm I get too impatient with myself. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm doing a prostatectomy and I, I do a posterior approach to the vas and seminal vesicles. If I can't find the vas, 
for more than 30 seconds. I won't keep digging in that one spot. I'll zoom out and I'll go to the internal ring and I'll find the vast there and I'll trace it down. If I didn't do that, the case will start to slide. That'll be the case that I'll injure a ureter or something like that. So this frustration watching my own self struggle that I won't, that I can't tolerate. Do you ever engage the opinion of trainees? All the time. So, you know, I think that that's a, the second attribute of people that I try to emulate is that they empowered the team. I'm constantly saying, hey, so let's take that same example. Guys, I'm not seeing the vast here. Does anyone have any ideas? Am I in the wrong spot? I will say that out loud and, you know, invite everyone to chime in. The scrub nurse, the circulator, and everyone looks up at the monitor. If you, if that's a thing that you say honestly, you know, there's a tendency for young trainees to think that that's going to paint them in a negative light, but I think it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Obviously I think there's a lot of both self-confidence as well as humility that comes along with doing that. And, you know, to take it one step further, I've certainly had cases where I've called in my partners to have a look and I've seen it as well. I was kind of mind blown when one time Jeff Kadedu called me into his room. He's like, Aditya, what do you think? And this is like, you know, one of my like mentors, surgical role models. And he was asking my opinion and it meant a lot. It also showed me that, hey, I don't have to have it all totally figured out and above asking somebody else to, you know, lay some eyes on it, come up with a, a different strategy. And I think if you, if you're in a decent practice, your partners, just like any intraoperative consult are gracious, happy to help. And, you know, by all means you can learn something. Yeah. I mean, there's so many beautiful things about that anecdote. I mean, first of all, the humility and self-confidence of your mentor to pull you in is awesome. I mean, that, that's how things should be. The common denominator is there's a patient on the table, right? So nobody's pride matters. Nobody's ego matters. And I would take this one step further for any residents or medical students who are listening. When you're looking for a job, you want to try and figure out if that is the culture where you're ending up. There are places where people wouldn't consider calling a colleague in for an extra set of eyes because it's considered a sign of weakness or it's, you know, you're putting them out or something like that. And again, I try to make this a habit so my team knows that, that if they see something, that they should speak up. I was doing a robotic nephrectomy and I got into some hyalur bleeding before I had things exposed well. And I don't like on block stapling. Generally speaking, I like to isolate the artery in the vein. But the bleeding was substantial. I grabbed it with my, my left hand bipolar and so I was able to stop the bleeding but really couldn't tell where it was coming from. And I took my head out of the console and I said, does anyone, does anyone have any ideas? And I was doing this at a hospital where I don't do partial nephrectomies because the backup is not robust enough. And my bedside assistant said, hey, don't you use bulldog clamps for partials? And I said, yeah, mind you, we'd never use those at this hospital. He said, why don't we put a bulldog where your left hand is and then you'll have two hands and we can figure out the anatomy and maybe we can get out of this situation. It was such a great idea. We did that exactly. And I'll tell you, I, would, I wouldn't have thought of that. And we, we rescued that potential complication. It was a small opening in the vein. We isolated it, put a tiny stitch, got through the rest of the case safely. And, you know... I'll never forget that. I actually wrote a letter to his superior just highlighting how how much he had contributed to the to the team and to the surgical outcome. Yeah, that's great. I was very fortunate in Dallas. There was a PA residency program and the bedside assist was always a PA and they had done thousands of cases and they could basically do most minimally invasive operation with their sucker. But the tips, tricks were just amazing. And certainly as a trainee, you know, the things that you picked up from the PA and it actually looked, I think the attendings give residents a bit more autonomy because they were so good. And 
it was never about titles or this or that. It was just about, hey, we're all here on the same team trying to learn something and, and take care of this patient. The thing is, the converse, the converse is dangerous. If you don't present yourself as someone who's open to the team, then they'll let you hang yourself out to dry and not give you any tips. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely human nature. You know, you're not going to be probably chomping at the bit to help somebody out that's hard to work with. Now, what what if you find that you're actually that you've barked up the wrong tree, things are going not going well, that you've done something wrong? How do you kind of handle that? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's crucial to have the attitude that you are okay with being wrong. You have to have flexibility in thought so that you can flip-flop. I mean, you know, in politics, politicians are chastised for f changing their point of view. But as a surgeon, I think you have to be, you have to almost expect it. For example, I, I don't declare anatomical findings very concretely early on. And I try to get my residents to say things like, this is probably the gonadal vein, or this is probably the renal artery. This is probably the ureter. It just gives you, I mean, obviously at a certain point, it becomes clear, but if you pigeonhole yourself into always being right and always being super confident, which is a stereotype of a surgical personality, then you will pigeonhole yourself into letting a case get worse and worse. Yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm kind of smiling and reflecting because I think I've got so many like idiosyncratic sayings now. And like for the ureter example, somebody will say, oh, that's the ureter. And I'll always say, I'm not ready to bet the house yet. Because until I until I know no, I'm I'm not going to commit, and I I think it is easy to mentally just decide on something, and if it's if it turns out not being the case, and you know an example that I that I think you've you've talked about is you know for a left kidney case, you've got to know where your aorta is, your your SMA is. It's declaring something a little too concretely that leads to catastrophes like ligation of the SMA, et cetera. Absolutely. Quick anecdote. One of my good friends, a urologist, very well-trained, excellent surgeon, he was doing a nephrectomy and he put a wet clip on the what he thought was the renal artery, felt uneasy about it, explored the anatomy further, didn't cut the artery and said, you know what? I think I'm, I'm wrong here. I think this is the SMA. He removed the clip ultimately found the renal artery, did the nephrectomy, and the patient was fine. But think about, again, the humility that it takes to put a clip on the SMA and tell everyone in the room you made a mistake and remove it. That's incredible. That's exactly the right thing. And it requires flexibility and thought. And that patient would have potentially died and now suffers no consequence at all. You can't fault somebody for maybe having the wrong initial thought, but you can fault somebody for letting that slide and not changing course again. I mean, I get into the wrong plane all the time, don't you? Yeah, of course. I mean, it happens and, you know, I'm trying to, you know, any, any number of times things can change. Tissue planes are totally unpredictable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you kind of mentioned this, David, you know, trust your gut. Like there is, to me certainly as a trainee, when you're like doing an operation, sometimes there, there'd be this sense of uneasiness. And it was, you notice it then, you leave the case feeling it. And it's a, it's a terrible feeling of like, basically, you know, did I help this patient or not? And, you know, by all means, I've, I've had some, you know, complex cases, tumor thrombi, nasty RPLNDs, where you're like, oh my gosh, this is, something's up here. Can you talk about that uh, that feeling a little bit and, you know, what, what kind of stock you give to it? Yeah, so this concept of trusting your gut, I think, is key and helps me stay out of trouble. The great news for trainees is, in my experience, I'd love to know what your experience is. I think that nearly every resident already has this innate radar and all they have to learn is to trust it. So if a resident is dissecting in the wrong plane and I tap them on the shoulder and say, how do you think things are going? They almost always say, not good. But 
all I have to teach them is, okay, when you have that not good feeling, change something. Change something. Zoom out. Leave the room. Come back. Ask yourself, am I in the right spot? I actually can't think of a, of a time where the resident didn't innately have a sense that something was wrong. Yeah, I like that. And I'm going to start doing that instead of getting frustrated or trying to explain it. I mean, usually I'll say, clearly I'm not explaining this well. Let me try to show you what I mean. And it's not intended to be mean or nasty or undermining. I'm literally like, all right, I'm not doing a good job explaining this. But I think the first thing first would be, you know, exactly what you said. How do you think this is going? Just to A, confirm that the resident has a sense of what's kind of good and, and maybe not good reflect on it a little bit and then, you know, intervene. You know, well, I tend to, um, in M and M conferences, I like to ask people, you know, cause the story is often, I'm sure this is every department around the world, everything was going great until, but if you really pro people, the 10 minutes before the bad thing, how were things really? And then you usually get a deeper story. Well, actually. We were a little concerned about this and that. So for example, there was a case of a ureter ligation instead of the vas. And on further discussion, it was more like, well, you know, actually we were having trouble finding the vas and we thought maybe we were a little too lateral and there was peristalsis for a second, but then we thought, no, no, that's not peristalsing. And, you know, so this falls under trusting your gut to me. And if you ignore your gut, you'll run into trouble. So what are some of the things that you do when you feel like things are a little off? Do you, do you switch to another part of the case? Do you phone a friend? What, what are your kind of go-to mechanisms? And of course, there's varying degrees of things aren't right. But yeah, what are, what are some of the things that you, you kind of turn to, David? So I do a lot of minimally evasive surgery. So, you know, this would maybe be relevant to anyone who does laparoscopy or robotics. The first thing I do is I zoom out. I mean, I can't tell you how many times just zooming out and reevaluating what I thought certain landmarks were got me back on track. It's simple, but, you know, if you're doing open surgery, the corollary would be change your retraction. You know, you got to book Walter in, change a couple blades, add a few more clicks to a different blade, you know, change something. Or bounce around, work on an easier part of the operation and come back to the thing that was making your gut you know, start alarming or back to what you said before, call in a colleague. Yeah, I think, I think those are good ones. And some of the things that I feel like you've, you've brought up are after taking a break, leaving the room, you mentioned calling in a, a colleague. So obviously, as long as it's not a dangerous scenario, you'll just pop out and get a drink of water, refresh, recollect and come back on, on in. Yeah, I will. I mean, I'll, I'll leave the room. You know, I just want to mention uh, one of my most um, incredible mentors, Dr. Zinman, who unfortunately recently passed away, but he was one of the giants in reconstructive urology. He took breaks where he left the room and he would come back with fresh eyes. A couple generations ago, you went into the OR and you didn't leave no matter what. I mean, for some people, I think Dr. Zinman might have been an exception for his generation, but... You didn't, never went to the bathroom. You never had a drink of water. You didn't, you didn't take breaks. I think that, that has changed. You, you can leave the room when there's a break in the action, as long as, as you say, nothing dangerous is going on. And grab a friend to come in, take a look, or maybe just you come back and you'll see things differently. What it's trying to mimic is when you're the colleague who is coming in to help someone else, you have a different mindset that allows you to maybe see things differently. You're trying to recreate that for yourself in your own case when you leave the room and come back. Yeah, I, I, it's a good point. I haven't kind of tried that route in terms of resetting for the operation, but certainly something to consider, you know, if, if things are just not really moving forward or, or tending to be particularly difficult. And what about, you know, are there parts of cases that you find that are just difficult every time, they're annoying, you don't like them, or the, or the residents just struggle left and right. How do you kind of approach that? Because I feel like human nature is we focus on things that we're good at. We repeat doing things that we're good at because it makes us feel good. And if there's parts that are challenging or difficult or tricky, 
We may rush through them. We may not feel as comfortable with them. What do you, what do you do for those parts of the case and to import on trainees? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. The, I would put this in the broad category of be self-aware. You have to be self-aware. So there are parts of operations that I thought that I kind of wasn't good at. And usually, I mean, this I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it, if there's a part of the operation that you dread or struggle with, you're probably not good at it. You need to get better. I had a mentor who who said, turn the part of the operation you hate into the part that you love. And so I'll give you an example. I keep going back to prostatectomy examples because it's, it's, a, it's a familiar operation to most urologists. It's a love-hate relationship. It's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> I used to take an anterior approach to the vast and seminal vesicles. And shortly after fellowship, there were times where I struggled. I couldn't find the vast. And you know, you're saying, oh, I wonder if this patient has congenital absence of the vast. No, they don't. You just can't find it. So, you know, and I struggled and I, I kind of dreaded that step. If you dread a step, that's another sign that, you know, you need to work on it. So I went to the AUA one year and I saw a video of someone doing, it was a live surgical video of somebody taking a posterior approach and I'd never seen it before. It wasn't part of my training. And I thought, wow, for whatever reason, my brain matches up with that approach. I can, I can see the anatomy easier. I switched to that approach and that step became a step that I loved. I loved because I had it figured out. And so I think just the recognition that when you're struggling, you might need to brush up on the anatomy or you might need to go watch somebody else do it or something. Some, there's a reason why you don't like a step. Maybe you need to do it differently or get better at it. Yeah, I think that's especially important as you start your practice. I was fortunate to have trained with people that did both anterior and posterior approaches. And I ultimately decided the posterior approach was the best fit for me. And early on, I would really kind of stress out, like, you know, am I going to make my peritoneal incision in the perfect spot and find the vas in the SV? If it was an obese patient, as they often were in Texas, big prostate, large floppy bladder, you know, like until I found a kind of eggshell white structure that I knew was either the vas or the SV on the right or the left, like I would be, you know, pretty worked up. And over time, you kind of get a little bit comfortable with it. And, you know, you watch some videos, kind of reflect on your own videos, what you did well or, or not well. And now it's absolutely one of my favorite parts. And I can kind of point out the anatomy very, I think, reliably to the, to the patients. I've kind of got my spiel. Here's your periorectal fat pads. You need good tension, you know, really definitively in size of peritoneum. And you can never be too low, which is something from Jeff Kadedu. And, you know, they just pop out fairly reliably. But I like that, you know, to, to really dial in on, you know, what parts of the operation make me uncomfortable? You know, is it cutting out a tumor for a partial? Is it overstowing the base so I get worked up when we're under ischemia? And really trying to, trying to work on that and take away a bit of the stigma. That's a good, good thought there. Yeah, you know, and it, it, what we're talking about today is mental constructs to avoid complications. And, and so it's worth mentioning that if you take this concept to the extreme, we're talking about steps that we're uncomfortable with, but we might be uncomfortable with entire operations. Each of us is not cut out to do everything. And if you're self-aware, after a period of attempted learning, th there may be some operations that you shouldn't do. It's, it's, it's true of, of me. I, I don't love IVC thrombectomies, for example. I don't do them. I mean, it takes some self-awareness to come to that realization. Uh, and that's okay. I have colleagues who love it and are probably better at me at doing it. So I think we have problems in surgery where a surgeon isn't self-aware and continues to try to do something that perhaps they shouldn't. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think oncology is probably one of the worst offenders where you finish your training and many times because of the personas involved, maybe it's your own personality type you come out feeling I should be able to do everything. And, you know, there's less common cases. There's inguinal lymph node dissections, there's RPL and Ds, there's tumor thrombectomies. I mean, there's all any number of things, you know, big tumors in solitary kidney. And it's not probably totally realistic that you're really good at all of those or enjoy doing all of those or enjoy handling the complications. And 
I mean, on the flip side, you know, you may or may not have the patience to really do like excellent MRI ultrasound fusion biopsies. And that's the, that's the other extreme. I mean, for myself, I, I don't get really excited about like trying to like contour things like perfectly. And there's colleagues that I think are just lights out at that. And, you know, I was just like, all right, well, I'm not, I'm not like a big prostate biopsy guy. And it's not that it's below me. I'm just like, I don't, you know, necessarily spend all the time that, that might be required. And, and I've actually come full circle where I kind of like being involved from the diagnosis onwards. But early on, and some of it was, you know, going back to what you say, it was intimidation. You know, we didn't do MRI ultrasound fusion biopsies as a resident. So I never felt that comfortable with it. And I kind of didn't like it. And then I avoided it. And then I actually immersed myself and had to do it properly, got trained. And now I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So I, I, I totally hear you. I think if there's things that you like or don't like, focus on what you like. Seems obvious. Yeah, you got to play to your strengths. So I, I've definitely had cases where, where things are tough. You know, it's a nasty RPL and D. You've made your 55th aortotomy. You're kind of stressed out and phoned a friend, called a partner. And when things are not going well, and sometimes you have the luxury of more or less time. I mean, you're like a big tumor thrombectomy. Like, you know, it can be hot and heavy for five to seven minutes. And then usually things are perfectly fine. But when things are going bad, what can you do to prevent them from becoming worse? Yeah, so if an actual complication is occurring or things are sliding, it can be like a domino effect. For me, there's a certain feeling I have. I suppose it goes back to the gut feeling, but when a case is heading off the rails, you can feel it and you you got to get it back on track so that you don't get this domino effect. Let me give you an example. Let's talk about an actual complication. I had one access complication, getting Hassan access, where I put holding sutures in the fascia opposite each other. One surgeon pulls up and the assistant pulls up on the other and we cut the fascia in the middle. One of those holding sutures was put in too deep and went into the, it, it seemed like the aorta, but it actually ended up being the sigmoid mesentery. And as we pulled up, it sort of cheesed through or evulsed the part of the sigmoid mesentery. And upon entry, there was significant blood already in the abdominal cavity. And at that moment, my one thought was, you have to rescue this. You can't, you can't let this get worse. So how, how this could get worse is either the patient exsanguinates before you can convert, or you start throwing sutures in and you create additional vascular injuries, or you cause bowel ischemia, or some, there's a lot of different branches to this tree where an access injury can get worse and worse. I felt my heart rate, I felt myself getting tachycardic and started sweating. I don't know if you remember studying for the oral boards, but did you take a review course? I did, yeah. Yeah, in the review course I took, they talked about when you're in the elevator going up to the hotel room for your oral boards, you will be tachycardic and you will be tachypnic and practice how to center yourself. I'm just bringing that up because this is a similar situation. I have previously imagined how I would center myself. I started taking deep breaths. In my head, I said to myself, you got to get, there's still a patient here. You've got to rescue this. I calmed myself down, held pressure in a very controlled way. We were able to open, get a vascular surgeon in there and patient lost 600 cc's of blood. It could have been a lot worse than that. No bowel ischemia discharged within a day or two. It's still a bad outcome, but it is not a, it could have been worse. Do you use any of those techniques? Yeah, it, it takes a lot, I think, to have the presence of mind to be like, calm down and think logically because you can, your mind can just start racing, you're catastrophizing and it's scary. I mean, you know, it's, it's a real person there and I feel like I do a pretty decent job of, all right, you know, say, you know, I think bleeding is probably the most gut-wrenching scenario, but but to try to stay calm and compose is important. I mean, one-on-one, hold pressure, stop the bleeding. Right. Two, touch base with anesthesia. How's he doing? Get blood in the room, whatever. I mean, thank God, in, at least in my experience, a very, very rare situation where you cannot stop the bleeding, get resuscitated, get back up, call for help. And 
you know, sort it out. But, you know, even these like 101 things like stop the bleeding, get folks in, make sure you have good access. Like you just have to pause and allow yourself to be logical. Yeah. Because when it happens, it's, it can be very scary. I mean, you know, sometimes you're throwing a suture and your hand's shaking and you're like, oh my gosh, like I've got to like calm down here and like do what I need to do. Right. And when you were asking me the question, I, I gave you the most extreme scenario as an example. This concept of not making a bad situation worse can be much simpler. You're just dissecting in the wrong plane. If you keep going, you know, no complication, let's say no complication has occurred. You're just in the wrong spot. I think, uh, you know, that's the other end of the spectrum for this question. And um, it, it goes back to being impatient with yourself, recognizing you're in the wrong spot, recognizing you feel uncomfortable, noticing it and doing something different. Yeah. And it's, it's funny you kind of mentioned that sometimes I feel like both for myself and certainly for trainees, when things are going good, they just keep going. It's like, you know, you're dropping the colon, for instance, on like a left-sided kidney case and the planes are just beautiful. They're showing themselves to you, rock and roll. And next thing you know is, hey, you're medial to the aorta. And, you know, I think you talk a little bit about this, you know, the beginning and the end. And my phrase for that is like, I know you're having the time of your life, but this step has to end at some point. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so if you're in my OR with the residents, you'd hear me talk about this all the time. Steps have a beginning, but steps have an end. And Early trainees have trouble articulating when a step is supposed to stop. So if you take that and, you know, there's overlap with the concept of having micro steps, but let's take the colon example that you brought up. When do we stop dropping the colon? We stop dropping the colon when it's reflected passively. You don't have to actively push it out of the way. And you can see the relevant landmarks on in the retroperitoneum. So you can see the ureter and the gonadal and the psoas muscle. So that's the end. That's the end. You keep going and all of a sudden you see, you're on the left side and you see duodenum and, you know, you're on the other side. I had one very memorable complication as a trainee where it was a right-sided partial nephrectomy in a patient who'd had a cholecystectomy. There were adhesions. I was lysing adhesions and I kind of got on a roll and I kept lysing the adhesions and I had good exposure. I kept going. And I actually injured the common bile duct as a, as a trainee. And that was the case that solidified this tenant to me. Thankfully, the patient did, did okay and the complication was rescued. However, it just made me realize steps have an end. That sounds frightening. I remember being on a surgical oncology rotation, one of the attendings mentioned, what do you think happens when you look up common bile duct injury on Google? And I said, I don't know you know, how to repair it. And he's like, no, 55 lawyers names. But, you know, I appreciate you sharing that because that's not easy to do. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. You know, whether it's the renal artery, you've got, you've got absolutely what you need to do to kind of accomplish what you need to do. And you just kind of keep going and it's a small vein. And now it turns from a great, highly controlled situation to different. Yeah, that's exactly what happened in this case. I, I was cocorizing the duodenum, got into some bleeding, didn't want to use cautery, put some clips and the clip side bit the common bile duct. That's how that went down. Yeah, I mean, we lice adhesions until we have exposure. We drop the colon until it's reflected away. So, you know, you can need to know when to stop. Yeah, I think it goes back to having clear instructions. You know, if it's a right-sided kidney case, like I want to see the anterior and the lateral sides of the, sides of the cava, then there is no guesswork. Here's your cava. Here's your right renal vein coming off. And, you know, when I can provide clear instructions to the trainee, I, I'd like to think that they benefit instead of, you know, you start dropping the colon and you start digging around and now you can get into like, into the fat within gerotas or you're digging into the psoas or God knows what, and it's not good. And, you know, I, I also think that there's a lot of benefit in just seeing what other people do. One of the things that we kind of implemented when I was involved with Grand Rounds is actually a, we kind of alternated our Grand Rounds style, like it'd be a debate one day, literature review one day. And we started doing surgical videos and, you know, it'd be a good dissection from your European urology surgeon motion, five different ways to do it. And, you know, somebody would kind of present and, and we'd do that. And we also talked about, but never got to actually getting together and like watching somebody else's prostatectomy for tips and tricks. Do you ever, do you ever try to watch other, other surgeons? You know, I, I frequently do that. 
I think it's crazy that our formal surgical training appears to end after residency or after fellowship. I mean, I'll frequently try to go into other surgeons' ORs between cases, see what they're doing. First of all, it's nice from a collegiality standpoint to go in and give people some compliments, beautiful dissection and all that kind of stuff. That's part of what's nice about working on a team. But I always pick up something. I mean, I always, so many of my, the things that I do came from dropping into other people's ORs and, and watching. Yeah, absolutely. I think certainly within our own specialty and then a thousand percent when you get the opportunity, you know, whatever they may be to to see another person. I'm always kind of a little shocked with say how like the general surgeons handle the bowel. I think it's like, you know, they're, they're just manhandling it because they do this day in and day out. And I think they're probably thinking the same thing with us in the ureter. You just grab it and you go nuts. So I think there's absolutely tons that can be learned within our own specialty. I mean, generational education, backgrounds and in various different techniques. I mean, not just within oncology, but how did the recon folks do this? How did the X, Y, and Z do this? Um, It is amazing. And I think some very progressive programs actually have bonuses built in if you cooperate. Oh, really? Not cooperate, but like operate with another surgeon. You know, you do, you double book cases. Say it's a prostate. And if we were at the same institution that we do it together, four times a year, for instance, then you could actually get a bonus. And um, I've liked that. I mean, you know, some of it's kind of challenging, right? We, everybody's busy, blah, 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 to kind of carve out that time to go watch somebody else operate in, in a meaningful way can be challenging. But, you know, your learning may plateau, and I bet you there's a spike every time you do that. 100%. Yeah, no question. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And, and you talked about, you know, another major avoidance here is is running through the the really the bad stuff that can happen you know having this having your checklist and it can be small things any after any endoscopic case trbt terp whatever i always tell the trainees you got to look and see where your irrigant is hanging if it's up at the ceiling that may give you kind of a false sense of hemostasis if their blood pressure is 80 over 60 that may not be reflective of reality like you've got to have your things that you do every time meticulous drop the pneumo take a look if it's a big kidney you've got to irrigate and have them do a valsalva like your mental checklist of of the bad things that can happen and and how you're going to handle it yeah absolutely you know you could take exiting the bladder after a minimally invasive lap or robotic case you we exit the abdomen the same way every time. We watch the trocars out. We drop the pneumo down. We close the fascia in a certain way. We introduce drains in a certain way. That Those checklists and routines give you a sixth sense when something is off. And so we talk about preparedness. I think it's very important also, as as you alluded to, to prepare for really catastrophic scenarios so that when they occur, you already know what your plan is. Like that access injury I, I, I talked about, I had pre-planned for that scenario, hoping it would never occur. You know, it gives you the ability to kind of act it out when it's happening and stay calm. So, you know, if I punctured the aorta at access, what, what would I do? And you mentioned talking to anesthesia, holding pressure, alerting the team. I need an open major basic tray. I'm going to need the book, Walter. Somebody put it on the post someone call vascular surgery, is the patient type and crossed? You know, if I had an air embolus, what would I do? If I cut into the external iliac vein during a lymph node dissection, what would I do? You know, I don't want to minimize these, but if you prepare enough, those moments hopefully can feel somewhat anticlimactic. I mean, you've thought it through so many times that when it actually occurs, you're ready. Totally. I mean, the quintessential case for me is a robotic R, pill, and D. The prep of... We have the four O's with the Laperti, we have this, we have blood in the room, the open set's available. And, you know, these are highly select cases where they should be fine. But as soon as I kind of let my guard down is when it's going to be a problem. And, you know, if that day comes, I'd like to think I'm going to be lights out, ready to go. You know, the bedside knows you hold pressure with the, with the, you know, large spoon, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's, and not only to mentally have it in your own mind, but also convey it to the team. Yeah, that's a good point. When appropriate, without causing alarm. And then, you know, the the last bit of it is, I guess there's kind of two sides of this coin. You know, when a case goes wonderful, 
and everybody's just kind of high fives all around. I was like, yeah, this is not us. This is the anatomy that we can thank here. The tissue planes, uh, you know, they really kind of opened up and, you know, we, we can thank the patient for this. And then of course there's the, the other half of this, right? That when things don't go so well, is it fair to blame the anatomy? Right. So I, I will tell you that the surgeons that I tried to emulate as a trainee and, and still do were not anatomy blamers. If your first instinct is, oh, this patient's anatomy is off, I would encourage you to make that be your ninth instinct, not your first instinct. Okay. You know, I mean, if someone's anatomy is truly aberrant, I think that should be a diagnosis of exclusion. I, like, I'm always looking to blame myself first. Like, how am I getting confused here? How have I misled myself? Not does the patient have, like, if you go right to the anatomy's messed up, I think you're just asking for trouble. I hear you a thousand percent. And, you know, if I had a dollar for every time I thought to myself, especially during my first couple of years, like, I just wish that this operation could be done by me and by like Jeff Cadetti or Klaus or Vitali, the exact same patient, the exact same operation. So I could just figure out what I did wrong. It wasn't, you know, cause I, I was in tune to that, you know, to me in my mind, I was like, you know, what's going on? Is it, is this a me thing or is this the patient thing? And you don't really get a, it's a you thing or it's a patient thing. You know, fast forward several years, there are those cases where you're like, oh my God, that was just a total beat. And you feel like decent that, you know, a, a straightforward case, you can kind of get through it without too much of a to-do. But I, I hear you loud and clear, you know, when you, when you start, I think we can appropriately thank the anatomy when things are very well. And not that we're kind of devoid of any involvement in that, but on the, on the flip side, you know, when things are not going well, it's, it's probably not totally the patient's fault. Yeah. I mean, I think you bring up a good nuance, which is the longer you've been in practice, the more you can sort out the anatomy here sucks, the renal fat is hostile. But when you're starting out, if you have that attitude, I, I promise it'll lead you astray. Well, David, this has been amazing. And, you know, I think taking the time to reflect on what can we do, what other people do to get through operations safely, to make it positive, to have it be a you know, kind of a team effort where people feel well is excellent because I don't think we do that enough. But as, as we kind of come at an hour, you know, any, any kind of final thoughts for our listenership? First of all, thank you for arranging this discussion. I agree with you. These are things that aren't spoken about enough. What's going on in our head, our attitudes, our mental constructs, our mindset, we, we don't we don't talk about these things enough. So that's one thing. The second thing is to all the trainees out there, when you're in an OR with your mentors and things are going well, try to think about these things. What can you attribute things going well to? Can you actually codify it? And the flip side is when things feel feel bad, why do they feel bad and how can you turn it around? Yeah, it's simple, right? I mean, it's it's that feeling you get. What is it about that feeling that's good or bad? You know, what is it about that teacher that's good or bad? Incredibly, incredibly valuable. Well, David, I've certainly learned a lot, picked up some tips and tricks to, uh, you know, incorporate into my own OR. And, uh, you know, I, I thank you for your time. It's been really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Medavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.